Hello! Welcome to the second episode of Board Grand Prairie Public Libraries, one of Grand Prairie Public Libraries YouTube channels. My name is Michaela Meyer and today we're going to do some book reviews, we're going to do a craft and then we're going to look at a game walkthrough but not a video game walkthrough today. Today we're going to do Dungeons and Dragons. So without further ado, books! What books are we talking about today? First of all I want to talk about Bloom. Flowers are so fun, right? Not so much in this book. So how many of you know Kenneth Opal, the author? He's Canadian and he's one of the cool Canadians who actually stayed in Canada instead of moving to New York, which is fine. It's a cool place. I get it. But I like that, you know, some of them stay. He wrote the Silverwing saga. I don't know if any of you have read that yet. If you haven't and you like books like Warriors, then you will almost undoubtedly like the Silverwing Saga. It is about bats. It's not creepy. I mean, some of them can be a little bit creepy, but it's, they're not creepy bats. The bats are the main characters. They're the coolest part. I love them. Um, and I read it when I was about probably the age of most of the kids watching this for the first time. So it is, it's a bit older, but it's it's so good. It's so exciting. Anyways, I'm going to talk about his newest book. It's called Bloom. It's the first in a trilogy and it is about three teenagers and each of these teenagers is a little bit weird. So the first character we meet is a girl named Anaya and she is allergic to life basically. She microwaves her apple because if she doesn't she gets allergic reactions to that. She's allergic to gluten and eggs and I think dairy. Don't quote me on that one but I'm pretty sure. She's allergic to everything seasonal, every seasonal allergy you could have, pollen, ragweed, whatever. She's allergic to that, so there's just whole months that she just basically is a mess in. Her allergies in general, like bad health because of her allergies, means she's always like having trouble breathing and she's got really bad acne and she just feels really uncomfortable and gross in her own skin and just is very, very unhappy with this because it kind of holds her back, she feels like, from living her whole life. Anaya's dad is a scientist, which is important because he's a scientist who deals with plants and the title is called Bloom, so you can file that away in your heads, it's probably relevant. And her mom is a pilot. And they live on one of those small BC islands down there. Petra is another one of the female characters. She and Anaya used to be very close friends, you find out more about that when you read the story. Petra, her mom is a police officer and she is not allergic to most things but she does have one allergy and that allergy is to water. Right? Water. So she can't get wet. She has to like rinse herself off using special cleansers because she can't stand under like a shower head if it's raining. She has this huge ginormous umbrella to help protect her from the water because it even touches her if it even touches her skin she starts to react to it she can still drink it her disease hasn't progressed that far yet but it is one of those diseases that does continue to get worse and worse over time usually so she's living constantly in fear of a time when she won't even be able to do that anymore the last main character is named Seth he's a teenage male and I don't remember if he's in foster care or he was adopted, I'm sorry, but he's recently moved in with a family called, with a farming family on this island and they're an older couple but they seem to be like a really good fit for him. They're giving him a space, he really likes to draw but he doesn't want anyone to see his drawings because he draws interesting things and they do disturb some people. He's helping Mr. Anantos, uh, his new guardian, out on the farm when the story starts. So. Girl who's allergic to everything but not water. Girl who's allergic to water and boy who likes to draw. Um, they all go to the same school and when this story begins uh, it starts to rain. And it's interesting because this is a rain that the girl who's allergic to water is not allergic to. And for a moment she thinks she's cured and then she realizes for some reason this rain isn't isn't reacting to her. She accidentally got a little bit splashed on her and it didn't make her react. But when she went and like stuck her hand under the tap, she reacted to that. So there's something special about this rain. Shortly after the rain, these black plants start to grow 
and Maya notices them very quickly because her dad's into that sort of experimental plant thing. People start to question them. Turns out they're growing everywhere. And it turns out they're growing very, very quickly. They have all sorts of interesting effects on the world around them. One of which is they make everybody very, very sick. Everyone is having very bad pollen reactions, except for Anaya, the girl who's really allergic to pollen, whose acne has finally cleared up and she's feeling healthier than ever. And the three individuals find each other and become friends as they deal with the series of obstacles presented by these plants, which are insane. These plants are insane. They are crazy and they are insane and they know what they want and they will do anything to get it. So if you want to read a book about killer plants, this is 100% the right book for you. If you want to read a book that's a little bit scary, it keeps you on the edge of your seat and pushes you through to the end with the suspense and excitement, Bloom is an excellent book for you. It did just come out recently, but the second book is due to come out later this year and then the third book is supposed to come out next year. So you shouldn't have to wait too long, which I know is always a problem when a new series comes out is waiting for the books from the end to come out. So this one isn't going to be that bad, um, but it is a really exciting book and it is definitely a nice suspenseful adventure read and I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to just have something exciting going on in their lives right now. I really really enjoyed it. The next book we're going to talk about is called Takedown by Laura Chauvin. It is about two kids, so lots of books from multiple points of view today. One's a boy, one's a girl. They go to different schools, but they're both wrestlers. So how many of you watching this like wrestling? Not me. Props though if you do. Sure it's very cool. It's not my sport. I don't know a lot about it. But I did still really like this book. Um, wrestling is a sport that is often dominated by males. And so having a female wrestler is challenging for the character in this book as she tries to find her own place and really push her dreams. Um, what made this book special was the relationships between the main characters and their family and friends. While the characters aren't always very fleshed out, especially the secondary characters, their relationships are fleshed out very, very well and how they feel about other people and the dynamics that they have with their parents, with their siblings, with their friends, and how those shift and change as the story progresses. Because to be a wrestler, like to be good at most sports, you have to spend a lot of time working on the sport and during the season of the sport it can be all consuming with regards to your life. Let's take down. So Michaela is one of the main characters. Her name is almost mine, but not, so that's cool. She, her, she has two older brothers, both of whom wrestle, and a dad who is separated from her mom, who also wrestled. Her mom is very supportive of all the wrestling in her family. And she really wants to prove that she can do it, that she can be a wrestler because she feels like her dad's relationship with her brothers and with her is solely based on wrestling. And if she doesn't have wrestling, she doesn't have a way to connect to the rest of her family. So it's really, really important to her for some interesting reasons, but it's still become a huge part of who she is. So she really wants to wrestle, but the next step up is to go on the traveling team instead of just the recreational team. And the traveling team that her brothers are a part of and have her family has been supporting for years won't accept her because she is a girl. And the coach says girls cannot wrestle. So she gets really mad and really hurt and she joins another traveling team, which is where she meets the other main character of the book who's a boy named Lev. Um, Lev is a really sweet boy, goes to a different school, uh, is coping with his own issues regarding wrestling. He has an older sister who does track and field and he feels like the sports in his family have been tearing his family apart. So kind of the opposite of Michaela where the sports is what brings them together. He feels like they don't have time to do family things or enjoy time together anymore because they're always at one or the other's sports. Love and Michaela are both determined to make it to the state championships this year and they do wind up partnering up and helping each other learn and grow and becoming good friends. So this is a really good book if you like realistic fiction, uh, if you like sports books, if you like books about relationships. Um, I didn't expect to enjoy it. Sports books aren't always my thing but I did actually really enjoy it. Uh, sidebar, the library has recently genrefied the juvenile genrefied the juvenile genrefied the juvenile fiction collection so the upstairs books for middle grade readers 
um, these kinds of books. And so you're going to start to notice when you go in these stickers on the spines, there's different colors. Dark, uh, dark blue means sports. So all the sports books like takedown, uh, books on basketball, hockey, soccer, track and field, any kind of sports, gymnastics, are located in that section. So they're all together now and they're easier to find. Same with all the imaginative books, the historical fiction, adventure, etc. So scary. So Bloom will be with the rest of the scary books because we put the thrillers with the scary books. So there's different degrees in there. So be put off by that. So those are today's books. Okay, so now we're gonna make a friendship bracelet. To do this, you need embroidery floss, scissors to cut the embroidery floss, and something to tie it onto. You can see I've tied it onto a chair in this recording. I used four different colors. It doesn't really matter how many colors you use. You fold the colors in half so that there's eight strands instead of four, and then tie them around the chair. I did not tie this securely enough. You will notice it slip a little and I'll have to tighten it during the process of making this bracelet. Okay, so to make this knot, you simply flip it over to the left as if you were making the top of the number four, wrap the bottom of one of the threads around and under the rest of the threads and then through the loop of the four. That was a little bit confusing. And then you just pull it tight. Okay, so again, grab one of the threads, flip it over, make the top of a four, pull the bottom under the rest of the threads and then through the loop and then pull it tight, okay? You don't have to do anything else to make this bracelet. You just keep doing that over and over and over again. If you don't want the knot pattern to spiral around the bracelet, you can alternate the sides that you're doing. The four ends, you go to the left, then two one to the right, then one to the left, then one to the right. But I personally do prefer the spiral look. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. So when you're ready to switch to the next color, simply put the thread you were using back into the pile with the rest of the threads, select the new color, and begin the process of knotting again. Okay, so zoomed in, you can see here what I mean about the knots going down the side. I was trying to force them, don't do that. They go naturally in the best place. The better you get at it, the better they're gonna look. Um, and then we'll just do a knot while we're zoomed in to help get a better look at how that works. So there's the four, under the rest of the threads, through the loop, pull tight. And the camera has decided to be smart and focus on the books behind instead of what I want it to focus on. So let's just move along. Because we folded the embroidery floss in half, there are two of each color. And you'll notice that the thread that you're using to knot is gonna get shorter a lot more than the threads that you're just wrapping the knot around. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you're alternating at least sometimes between the two threads of the same color if, you wanna, if you're worried about the length. I had a lot of thread. I took three arms lengths worth of thread two is usually enough but I wanted to be safe so it wasn't the biggest issue but it is something to keep an eye on as you go if you want a really thick bracelet make one with more thread in the middle of what you're knotting and obviously that will make it thicker it will also use your thread even faster and if you want a thinner bracelet you can use even less Once you think your bracelet is long enough, you can measure it against your wrist. Mine was a little bit shorter than I should have done, but that's okay. Ideally, you've just looped it around instead of doing this weird knot thing that I did and you can just cut it free. I'm gonna have to cut mine free in a couple places <laughs> because I honestly don't know what I was doing. It took me a bit to remember how to make these, sorry. Finally, you just tie your completed bracelet around your wrist. There's me awkwardly trying to do it to myself. Um, some knots are wish knots and when they fall off your dreams or your wish is supposed to come true. Otherwise, you know, they last until they last. If you want to be really fancy, you can put a button or something on it to make it easier to take on and off. But that is how you make this particular friendship bracelet.
so pretty. So finally, we're going to talk about how to play a game called Dungeons and Dragons. You don't need a lot to play Dungeons and Dragons, but you do need a couple of things. You do not have to buy any of the fancy books or accessories that go with it. You do need to go online and find the basic rules, which are free, and either to print them off or download them and read them on your computer. You do need to have pencils and paper. You can print off free character sheets online. So Dungeons and Dragons D&D &D is a TTRPG, which means tabletop role-playing game. So that means you play it on a table with dice and pencils and paper. You don't really need anything else. Um, you do. You should read the rules. You can read the basic rules online. Familiarize yourself with those. You need to have some sort of character sheet, some sort of record of your character's abilities because that will determine your roles and how good they are at certain things. It's like playing imagination games with your friends, but with the rules. <clears throat> so when you say, I hit you, and the other person says, no you don't, and you say, yes I did, there's rules about how you hit people and if it works, and you probably shouldn't attack your teammates. Pro tip. You'll often hear it referred to as DND 5e, Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. So 5th edition is the current edition, and it's definitely the most beginner friendly and the most user friendly in general. So I do recommend if you want to play it, you start with that one. Okay, so when you're first, the first thing you usually do, unless you're the dungeon master who's planning the campaign, is you build your character. There's two really important things to keep in mind when you're building your character. And the first is what race you want to be, and the second is what class you want to be. And those two things can work together or they can work against each other. Either can be really fun to play. So just because they don't stack well, it doesn't mean it's not going to be a really enjoyable character. My cousin just built a barbarian who is not very strong, but is in fact very intelligent. But he doesn't want to be smart, he wants to be strong. So he keeps doing interesting things in an attempt to prove that he is in fact barbarian material. Other people like to play characters who do naturally go well together. So characters, races that get bonuses to intelligence tend to make better wizards because they can be smarter. And the smarter you are as a wizard, the stronger your spells can be. So it just depends on how you want to play your character and what you think is fun. Because again, it's a game. The point is to have fun. If you're not having fun, you're not doing it right for you, okay? So we're going to go over the basic races. I think the simplest races to play are human. Obviously, humans are what you are. It's easy to play and understand. Culturally, they make sense to us, so it's easy to get into the head. Elves, elves are very, very different. They can live up to a thousand years in the Forgotten Realms, which is the generic setting of Dungeons and Dragons, although there are other settings. And of course you can make your own as well. They live up to a thousand years and they don't reach adulthood until age 100. So that's something to keep in mind. If you want to play a 30 year old elf, don't be 30, be 300 or 250. If you want to play what you would think of as a 17 year old, Maybe play like a 50 or 60 year old. It's probably more in line with what they think. I don't know the exact math, you could probably figure it out. But they live to 700 and they hit adulthood at 100, at which point in time they do take a new name. I know a little bit more about elves, they're my preferred race to play. Elves come in different types. So there are wood elves, high elves, and dark elves or drow. And they get different abilities based on which one you pick. So wood elves are better at hiding. High elves are better at magic, and dark elves are, you would need your dungeon master's permission to play a dark elf, because they aren't um, as much of a basic race, and they do have some serious bonuses as well as some serious drawbacks, depending on the type of campaign that you're playing in. Dwarves obviously would be the next one. They have the same, there's hill dwarfs, there's mountain dwarfs, and there's Dwargar or Dark Dwarfs, again Dwargar are not considered a standard race, you would need permission to play one. I do not recommend playing um, one of the weirder ones your first time through, so Hill Dwarfs, Mountain Dwarfs, slightly different abilities. Dwarfs are all about clan and family and loyalty, tradition, stonework, and being really like hardy, so like you want to resist poison, I'm a dwarf man, they good at that, they're good at that. H Halflings are like hobbits, you've all seen the hobbit. Or not go watch the hobbit there's lots of dwarves and there's lots of hobbits gives you honestly a pretty good idea of their temperament halflings are jovial and fun and kind and welcoming and quick on their feet and very very lucky 
very lucky, which is a really cool skill to have if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. They're also small. All these races do live various lifespans. So when you pick your race, read about them, understand where they come from, what their culture is, what their naming conventions are, how long they live, and how that affects their life. Okay, you're going to be playing this character, so take some time to understand what kind of character you're actually playing. If you don't want to do that, play a human. It can be a bit simpler. There's also Dragonborn, which are part dragon, half orcs, which are like part orc, part human, half elves, which are half elf, half human. There's a bunch of other races too, which are even more complicated, like Asimar, which are half celestial beings, Tiefling, which are half infernal beings, Arakakura, which are bird people, Wanti, which are snake people. There's tons of different options and people have homebrewed even more, but it's better for your first character if you pick a simpler one. You don't have to listen to me. You can do what you want and do what you and your DM think will work best for you and for the campaign, of course. But, um, for example, in the starter set, there's two humans, a halfling, a dwarf, and an elf. And there's a reason I think that they picked those races. Next up are your classes. There are 12 classes and they all approach the world and encounters and combat and trials very differently. So you want to pick one that matches up with the mindset that you want to play. If you want to be a rage monster who gets angry and punches or hits things, be a barbarian. Put most of your points into strength and smash things. Be the Hulk. It's fun. If you want to sing songs and cast spells, Bard is the class for you. They're very sociable. They like people. They like talking. They like flirting. They like having fun. That's a Bard and they do have access to a wide range of spells because they're a full caster. Next up is a Cleric. If you want to cast spells and not be squishy. So when I say squishy, I mean like if you take hits, you die. Bards are a little squishy. Clerics are like, hit me, I don't care. And they can also cast spells. They're divine magic, so they have a deity or a god that they worship and their power comes from that deity. So you want to make sure that your relationship with your deity stays good because if you go against your deity's principles and teachings, I don't think they're going to give you access to their spells anymore. And that's something that your dungeon master will talk to you about when you build your character. So when you build a cleric, you have to pick a deity that you worship. And there's tons and tons of deities in the Forgotten Realms. And most of the other campaign settings for Dungeons and Dragons also come with a list of gods that are uh, in the area. If your dungeon master is making up their own world, you can talk to them about the deities of their world because if you're a cleric, you need something is giving you power. It's coming from some form of god or concept or principle is granting you this power. It doesn't always have to be an actual god in Dungeons and Dragons. The paladin is the other divine magic user. So the cleric uses a lot of spells and a little smacky smack. The paladin does a lot of smacky smack and a little spell. And most of their spells are for better smackdowns. Um, usually as a paladin you, you take an oath. You have to swear an oath and the oath that you swear would depend on the deity that you picked. The most traditional ones with the most traditional deities um, involve things like you cannot lie. You must be honest in all your dealings, which can be really fun to roleplay when you have a character who literally can't lie and you have another party member who keeps stealing everything right in front of you. Shopkeeper comes up, somebody stole my... It was him, he did it. Because you can't lie by omission either. You can't not say a thing that's true. So I like playing rogues. I hate playing with paladins because they always get me in trouble. But it's also really fun to try and circumvent that and adds to some interesting party banter and roleplay. So that can be really fun. Uh, and that's just one type of paladin. Obviously there are different things that paladins can worship and different oaths that they can make, but whatever your oath is, you have to follow it. If you break your oath, you lose your powers as a paladin. So your oath is very important to you. Next up, we're going to talk about the nature-based users. So there's the druid. So druids turn into animals. If the idea of turning into a tiger or a bear and like mauling your enemy to death appeals to you, then 100% be a druid. No one else can do it the way a druid can. At the beginning you have two wild shape transformations a day and that number doesn't change until you hit level 20. At which point you magically have unlimited wild shapes a day. So if you're playing level 20 characters, druids are definitely like way overpowered. 
Most people, fair warning, do not get to level 20. The campaign dies for other reasons before then. Druids, so druids are in nature. They protect the wild. They can do lots of magic. They can heal and purify water and summon elemental spirits. They often kind of wander the wilds by themselves. And again, turning into animals is the biggest draw for the druids. The other nature-based user is the ranger. The paladin is to the cleric, what the ranger is to the druid. So the ranger is a bit more weapon smacky smack, a little bit of nature magic. Um, and there's different types of rangers, just like there's different types of all classes. One of the big ones for people who like to play ranger is the beast companion. So ranger has a subclass where you have an animal companion and it does level up and progress a little bit as you grow. Side note though, do the revised ranger. If you google it, it will show up. Revised ranger. Just the ranger has some issues that weren't great in the original player's handbook, but if you just, you can find the revised ranger PDFs online. And I really, really do strongly recommend that you go with those instead. Again, check with your DM, but they're kind of considered standard now among most players. So I would recommend doing the revised ranger if you want to do a ranger. Um, switching back, we have fighter is one of the most generic classes in Dungeons and Dragons. It's generic in a good way. There's so many different kinds of fighters and they can do so many different things. There's even some that can cast some magic. They're skilled in all sorts of weapons and armor. And they have, they get so many special abilities, like so many special abilities, more than any other class. Fighters are really easy to play, really fun to play, and a really, really well-rounded class. They are probably one of the classes with the most to offer, honestly, and I highly recommend them for new players. Again, for context in the starter set, two of the five characters are fighters, so they are a good idea. And so much variety within that class. Next up is the monk. Um, if you want to be like a punchy punch person instead of a smacky smack person, monk is the way to go. Monks are like the martial arts film masters, you know. They have different abilities too, like all the other classes, but if you want to be able to actually do damage with your fists, the only way to really do that is as a monk. Um, most times if you punch something, it doesn't do a lot of damage, doesn't matter how strong you are. Unarmed strikes just don't do much damage, but monks can punch things and they can punch things well. They aren't great in the beginning, so I wouldn't recommend it for your first character because you really want to get a few levels in Monk before they start to pay off, from what I hear. But I've never played a Monk, so I'm not the best person to talk about that class. My favorite class is the Rogue. It's just my favorite because it matches my playstyle. There's nothing inherently better that, with the Rogue than with other classes, but it does match my playstyle and how I prefer to approach the game the best. So when I don't know what to do, I'd be a rogue. I don't do it all the time. I do like to explore the other classes, but it is my happy place. Rogues are excellent if you want to overcome traps and obstacles, if you want to sneak around, if you want to kill people before they even know that you're there. They're great. And yeah, just think of your traditional thief or spy. They don't have to be bad. They don't have to steal, but they do the skulking around. The sorcerer who has magic within them, so it's in their blood, they have that power and they manifest in strange and unique ways. They're the only class that like has magic in and of themselves. So if that sounds fun to you, they can do things with their magic that other classes cannot do. Warlocks get their magic from a patron. Not a god, or not a cleric, but like some other being. So like the Archfey or a devil. There's a bunch of different places they can get their power from, but they make a pact basically they will do things for this patron if their patron will give them magical power. So it's usually people who are really interested in weird mysteries and knowledge will make these packs so that they can learn more about things. Um, and again, that relationship, so just like the cleric has kind of to keep in line with their god a little bit, warlocks have missions sometimes and objectives from their patron and they have to keep that relationship up or their patron can decide to cut them off from their power. I say these things as if they happen a lot in Dungeons and Dragons, they don't. Most players who pick Warlocks know what they're getting into and most DMs aren't super strict about that. In fact, you can pick a patron who doesn't care what you do with the power, but it's just something to keep in mind in terms of flavor that your power is coming from someone else and so that relationship is something that maybe should be invested in as you play the game. The final one is the wizard, it's Gandalf. It's very stereotypical. 
It's a cast someone who casts spells that they have learned from study. If you want to have more spells than anyone else, you want to be so versatile and know so many things, pick a wizard. Wizards write down spells they learn in spell books and they can learn endless numbers of spells. They can still only cast so many in a day. Every morning, most casters, not all, have to prepare the spells that they're going to have available that day. Wizards can choose from any spell in their book and they have the most options. So those are the basic classes. You want to be more smacky smack, sneaky sneak, fighty fight. Those are your options. Um, when you're building your character, it tells you how to do that in the player's handbook. If people want more Dungeons and Dragons stuff, shoot me an email and I'm happy to do more walkthroughs. Ultimately, everything you need to know to play Dungeons and Dragons is in the rules, but you have to read them and you have to understand them. There's forums and all sorts of places you can go. If you have questions, you're welcome to shoot me an email as well. Um, M Meyer, that's M-M-E-Y-E-R at gpbl.ca. Happy to answer any questions you have. If you have any other requests for this YouTube channel, let me know and I will see what I can do. We'll go back to a video game probably next episode, but with the popularity of Dungeons and Dragons, I did want to talk a little bit about that. The other site I mentioned that is a really good resource is D&D Beyond. The link will be in the description. Um, and it is like an official compendium. A lot of the stuff is paywalled. So if it's the player's handbook that you want access to, you would have to buy the player's handbook. But the basic rules are there for free and all you need to play are the basic rules. So don't feel like you have to spend a ton of money and buy a lot of stuff if you want to play Dungeons and Dragons. All you need are the basic rules, paper, pencils, and your dice. And if you're going online, you technically don't even need dice, paper, or pencils. All of those resources can be found online. Dungeons and Dragons is a really really fun game that lets you stretch your imagination in a social way and it's really easy to play while you're social distancing. But that is Dungeons and Dragons and that is how you play. Hope you enjoyed our episode today and we will see you next time.